Yeah, we, we are just uh, talking about our experience with the Osmo Comstack at the uh, Congress last year. Um, so um, it's it's a little bit chaotic. So slides are from Kevin, uh, Niels, and I will talk about it. So uh, hopefully it will not be a karaoke. Um, <laughs> um, we are well prepared, just like for Congress. <laughs> yes, um, it's it's similar to it. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is uh, how we started. So uh, at least you can see here, it's still uh, 3G is sometimes working, uh, sometimes not. Um, this basically tells how good the data at the, the data over 3G worked. But uh, it worked. I, I, two day, I think last week ago, I fixed the bug why it wasn't working. <laughs> I, I broke it before. I. I <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think it was 3G. Um, yeah, what, what we have done, so let's start with the frequency. Uh, um, so we got actually two frequencies. We got 3G in some band uh, gap we found uh, up, up there in the 850 megahertz band. So it's actually, it's a US band. It's used in Europe, but not for uh, 3G or not for uh, GSM or anything. It's actually used by those microphones, for example. <laughs> um, but uh, we could get a license, and it uh, seems to be we did not interfere with each other at the Congress. Uh, and we also managed to uh, borrow a, a couple of RFCNs for GSM from Telefonica, which was quite great because it was quite on short time this year. Um, so the problem is that there is no, no GSM band left, actually. I mean, of course, we could have also used the 5 megahertz for 3G for GSM, but yeah, the problem actually is in Germany there's no real free spectrum, and yeah, this is how we, how we basically worked out. Uh, at the last Congress, I think we had four. I, do, I don't recall the exact number of RCNs. I think four. I think four or so, with quite uh, low um, transmission power, about, I think, 100 milliwatts for 1800, and it was 10 or 20 milliwatts for 3G. Um, so here you see uh, we used uh, so Sysmo BTS for, for 2G, and for 3G we used uh, IP access, which worked. Um, at 3G we did not have any handover or uh, anything re related to it. So if you move out of your 3G while having a call, of course, it got disconnected. But for 2G, we even had handover, and, and it worked. Mm. So uh, yeah, here you see where. So this is uh, the Congress. It's quite big, actually. Um, but we don't know if it's the coverage was good or bad, but we didn't have so great statistics. Uh, I will come back to that point later, but uh, yeah, it was lots of base stations and the deployment worked well. Um, so we had more software problems than hardware problems. Guess where the GSM room was? <laughs> yeah. Where the one or nine and the two <laughs> are together in the same small room. Yeah, so we had basically one huge uh, 2G handover cell. Basically, this one was one which could cover all, uh, cut, cut, cover the middle and all a little bit to the um, 2G cells around it. So that was the idea that you can basically even walk with having a phone call from here over there was bridges over here and you do actually two handovers by by walking there. So that actually worked. Um, yeah, this was uh, our great setup what we've done. So it was a couple more demons. Uh, oh yeah, right. Uh, and some important stuff. So two years ago we had to create this wild tour around the whole uh, setup because some of them were crashing, other ones not. But last year, it were, everything was better. We only had one uh, while true loop only. Everything else worked stable in a quite stable way. Um, the other ones just stopped be because we kept stopping them to try new stuff. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, we already fixed some of the bugs there. Uh, it was also interesting to see if, if you have a setup with 
couple of thousand people, but I think it was around thousand uh, SIM cards online. Uh, yeah, new features. Uh, we managed to get 3G voice working, so 3G has a little bit different AMR. 2G has so it's 2G and 3G has a little bit different AMR in short, so it's also I think how they are encoded. And before we just couldn't directly connect a 2G to a 3G call. We could we, uh, we could only do 3G to 3G calls before, but this time we managed to uh, make it working and could even call into the other network. So at Congress we have one the GSM network, but the GSM network is connected to the phone operation center. They do like DCT. They have uh, it's much bigger DCT network. They they do there, and ha they have a lot more subscribers. And they do all the call routing. They do the numbers and everything. So basically, we connect our GSM 3G network to their voice server in the end. Uh, yeah, and because last year, so two years two years ago, we just deployed 3G and said, yeah, if 3G is working fine. We have no idea. We don't have time because of this big uh, well true loop around it. But this year we said, okay, might be there a better way that we can have stable and unstable um, users at the same time, so you could enable and disable 3G via USSD. So you just call USSD, enable the 3G in the HLR, and that way you uh, you could enable it. The same for 2G, so you could basically disable 2G, and uh, I've heard some users disable 2G and 3G at the same time. <laughs> I don't know how that worked. Um. So it, it came about like 3G was so sort of experimental and um, there was also actually another idea to say that um, like uh, we, we added a couple of patches. One was to send to the HLR whether the subscriber is connected on 2G or 3G so we could enable or disable it. But the other one was also to send it via SIP to the POC. Why did we do that? Because uh, Thomas had the brilliant idea to uh, if in case the subscriber is connected by 3G to tell the the subscriber um, via a, like the point was, we didn't know whether voice was working fine, so his idea was when he's calling via 3G to first tell him by a voice <laughs> wave file, you are connected via 3G and voice might be <laughs> experimental, which obviously wouldn't work if the voice doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> And if, it, if you hear the sound, you're fine, then you don't need to know it. Uh, so, I mean, that was one side, uh, one part of it. And the other was the USSD to enable or disable 3G. And um, then I went one step further because I wanted to test if uh, 2G is available. Um, does it, if 3G is not available, does it switch to 2G and vice versa? So I also added a, a switch to enable 2G. And by that, I created a, a path where you could lock yourself out of both 2G and 3G and have no way to get back in. And I don't think many people did that, in fact, but um, I managed to do it. I was like, oh, and disable 2G. You know. Yeah. Oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to go on the database and fix myself again. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, also, we we didn't had any interwet handover or anything. So if you switch from 3G to 2G, you just have to complete. Yeah, you have to do a routing up area update, and of course, no handover between those and between 3G to 3G. Only 2G worked well. Um, so, uh, from my opinion, we could say we had stable CS, which is also quite important. So people could say, okay, we don't like the DCT network. We would like to have. Uh, GSM and in my opinion I was quite reliable available but uh, yeah um, so except something broke down um, some somebody disconnected one building by a small cable which was actually in our room <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who yeah but they they came to us and fixed it themselves so it was really nice um, this was our ticket system it worked quite well so up till we arrived we had like the usual ticket system uh, online, but then we switched to an offline ticket system, and yeah, it really worked great that way. So, in my opinion, I would like to do it the same way again at the camper. Um. <laughs> yeah, and the place it doesn't rain on, otherwise, all the tickets are lost. <laughs> <laughs> Fixed, hopefully. Uh, so, in this picture, which 
Yeah. Wait, do we want to? Can you explain how the picture works? So which issues are open and which ones are solved? Uh, good question. <laughs> sort of going from left to right is the more volatile, undecided issues to on the right, the blue ones are the fixed, the done ones, basically. So you change yeah, the some color? some intermediate so steps that I can't really <laughs> see. <laughs> so, but basically the, the door wasn't used because that was uh, too unstable for the ticket system. I think it was some, something like here, left one is, uh, un <laughs> is, is open and right is closed. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, we still have to work on it, but I mean, the, it, it, so for one thing, as we as team has to organize with two other team basically. So for one part, of course, we have to uh, coordinate and communicate to the phone operations center, which much, which also much more improved over the last uh, two years or last two years. But we also have to talk to the NOC, of course, because we, are connect we, we first need one, uh, we need our layer two network across the whole site, or we don't need layer two, but we used layer two. And on the other parts, of course, we have to have some ca uh, cable wall ports connected into our layer two network. So that one also improved a lot. And so we are depending most likely on the NOC to set up our systems. I mean, the connection to the POC is more likely our GSM server must connect to their server over the SIP connector. <coughs> but um, yeah, for the NOC, so we have to cooperate. So it's, it's also somehow hard to, let's say, build one week before up because at that point, we don't know if ne is network's still there. It, or another example, yeah, okay, we place our base station up there. Oh, somebody is building a building in front of it. It's those kind of problems also, but uh, yeah. But I mean, we managed to get GSM working at day one. That was, I think, two and a half days early, uh, earlier than last year. Um, so yeah, it really, really improved as, as a team. Yeah. Uh, I don't know where the number comes from, 17,000 uh, SIM cards so far, so... Uh, across all Yeah, events. across all. Um, HLR, from the HLR. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's just from the HLR. From the HLR. Yeah, but uh, so, so as again, we improved on the statistics, but they are still not working reliable. So we had statistics, but they didn't really look well, so we... On one side, we didn't have the time to look what's wrong with the statistics. On the other one, so we would have created also nice dashboards. Uh, how, I mean, was the coverage good? How many call errors did we had? And so it's interesting statistics. We all hadn't really time to look into it, why they did not work. But, but for example, we had like two and a half calls. What does it mean? Uh, and other really strange statistics. Um, yeah, for that reason, we couldn't even tell you, hey, how good was the network? It worked for me. <laughs> yeah. And uh, this is, uh, I think, one of the phones which did not work anymore because we switched to AMR. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the point with 3G was we didn't do any transcoding, so we forced AMR onto 2G. And lots of phones can do AMR onto 2G, the Nokia phones and some older phones do not support AMR onto 2G. So they could send SMSs, but it was impossible for them to uh, to send uh, to make voice calls. And it's quite a pity because on these conferences, you bring your old phone, which is reliable, which has lots of battery, which is small, because you just want to be reachable. You don't. You already have a smartphone for something else. So uh, yeah, one of the big issues was that the old phones weren't supported anymore because we enforced AMR and we didn't do any transcoding. Yeah, but I think it was your old phone that wasn't working. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of other old phones that still worked anyway. But it's true, of course. It would be nicer to um, also support what FR1 even and then dynamically choose which one the phone is capable of. 
Yeah, or send SMS, hey, you have a nice phone there, but actually you cannot do any calls. Please buy a new one. At or we can send a voice <laughs> message. Your phone does not support voice. <laughs> <laughs> For example, yeah, we could do that. Um, oh, wait. Uh, yeah, so that are the to-dos we, we collected there. There are still a lot more to-dos. Um, so, I mean, the coding we already talked about, and I don't think if ESIM is really possible without contracts so far. Uh, yeah, 4G, let's, uh, let's jump to the camp talk about that, that thing, or I don't know, De uh, Dexter also uh, uh, talked about it, right? About 4G. Yeah. yeah. Um. Otherwise, what I can say, the contact to the POC was very good this time, and even weeks before Congress, I was um, having uh, talks and even like uh, phone conferences with two or three, with, with Linksys and Thomas from the POC, and we had um, VPN tunnels set up on uh, our like dev server connecting to the POC dev server, and we were already uh, using the Congress network when we were still at home and basically only would have had to move the VM onto the network premises except uh, some some guys, I'm not looking at anyone, decided to completely wipe out the server so we had to set up everything from scratch again. But also that worked pretty nicely because we had everything in a Git and Ansible and so on and so on. Uh, the, I uh, actually also used the config templating nonsense that I wrote in my Osmo Dev uh, Git. Some of you might know it. And uh, yeah, all in all, last year I was really, you know, it was really frustra frustrating because I was working on the Osmo MSC split uh, for a long time. And when we really tried it, everything just basically fell on its face and it felt a bit like my fault. And, you know, I was really yearning to see the network running smoothly and I got this in December and that was really nice to see, you know, that all the fixes are, uh, um, uh, of course, also due to the tons of TTC and 3 testing that we're doing now and the um, improved stability we got from that really, you know, drove uh, our network to a much more stable state and it was really nice to see it running. Yeah, I think also that that the the team also improved. I mean, like three or four years, we were three people, and now we are ten to fifteen people. So, also a lot more people came through and said, "Oh, we are a nice project. Let's let's work together on it." That was also quite great. Um, also from the organization standpoint, so we we have we have meetings before. We are preparing the setup. We are also having a test. Network even with the, together with the POC is is possible to basically test before Congress everything and not at the Congress. That also improved. I mean, we have also a lot of to dos on our side. For example, we we lost a lot of core dumps of the crashing network and the logs together because uh, yeah we we didn't test it before that that the crash dump collection and logs and pcaps work work well or ha have even an idea how we want to copy it over and uh, and so on so I, yeah i think it worked quite well at least if you only use 2g you ha you had a stable uh, connection this year um yeah and also with all the new split stack of course yeah um I think so, so far for the last Congress, this, that was it. So we have a lot of to-dos, but I think that would be more like the, the camp discussion or talk because all our to-dos are now at the camp list. So it's also nice to do more than one event a year. But I mean, the problem is where to get the licenses and to it because the park is doing four events a year or even more. I, I don't know exactly, but of course, you got much more practice when doing it more often. Yeah. Questions so far? Um, I'm wondering how did you restart the components? Did you just shut them off or 
<laughs> we don't have to restart them usually, they crash. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good answer. Um, but uh, there are systemd uh, services and systemd is restarting the service afterwards. Okay. I remember all the binaries were compiled with all two optimization and that actually made uh, like uh, investigating some core dumps uh, like more complicated. I think next time it would make sense to avoid this optimization. Mm -hmm. The big problem with, you know, testing patches and so on was that the hardware we were using was uh, an old rack that looked really fast, you know, uh, <laughs> judging by the noise it was making. <laughs> <laughs> but it was also running on a cryptic disk. So uh, only compiling the Osmo IUH uh, source tree that took forever. Like at, on my this laptop, compiling everything takes like what three minutes, five minutes max. And <laughs> there I was like sitting. It's half an hour later. It's still not even halfway through, and I'm just <laughs> waiting. You know, at one point I completely crashed uh, the entire system <laughs> by removing some libraries by accident, and then just want to quickly recompile and reinstall and then the whole thing went through and w was down for uh, what an hour or two before the bloody server was yeah, done the, building. The, the fun part is the year before so that was last the so last congress they had this nice noisy machine which is said okay that would be more powerful the year before we did everything on the apu the same setup and it was much faster yeah the point was <laughs> after the apu we wanted to have a proper system in place what we got was something like what two, three times slower yeah. than the APU. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so everybody is also invited if you like to play with, uh, with the camp or Congress network, just, uh, yeah, just join us and uh, have fun at the Congress or camp. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thanks.